Well, hello and welcome once again to ICMDA webinars uh, hosted by the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. I'm Dr. Mark Pickering, the Chief Executive of the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK and Ireland, one of over 80 member movements of ICMDA, which brings together over 60,000 Christian dentists and doctors worldwide. I'm standing in today for Dr. Peter Saunders, the ICMDA CEO, who's currently at the IFES World Assembly in Indonesia. And today I'm honored to be introducing Dr. Andre Van Mol, speaking on addressing transgenderism. And so it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Andre Van Mol. He's a, a family physician based in California in the USA. He co-chairs both the American College of Pediatricians Council on Adolescent Sexuality and the Christian Medical and Dental Association's Sexual and Gender Identity Task Force. And in those capacities, he advises legislators, government agencies, and legal and advocacy organizations internationally on these issues. I first met Andre properly in Hungary last year at the annual conference of the International Federation on Therapeutic and Counseling Choice. It was a real joy getting to know him and hearing some of his excellent presentation material there. So I've really been looking forward to hearing him again in today's presentation. So Andre, over to you. Good morning, everybody or evening, depending on where you are. Thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm gonna to be talking about gender dysphoria, the, the lecture I call uh, Gender Dysphoria, the Transgender Tsunami and Our Response. Uh, I plan for these next lecture notes that I'll be reading off of to be passed off to you tomorrow. They're about 80 pages long, 400 citations. It's, it's um, well, actually, let me just call it up here, if I may. Hopefully you can all see that. <clears throat> so. Uh, the first page is a table of contents to make it, you know, navigable. Um, it's built around the center section, the major bullet points. Uh, you can actually just go straight to that. And that's kind of what I refer to before I'm going to do a, an interview or something like that, or just for quick reference. And everything else in the lecture uh, expands on that. Uh, I'm going to have to really rip through this to get through it in 30 minutes. So uh, there's a lot of it I'm skipping, but it's going to be there for you. Uh, I would like to start just with this summary, a little seven point summary that if you remember nothing else, uh, this is it. One, that gender dysphoria is a diagnosis, whereas transgenderism is an ideology. Remember that the natural course of gender dysphoria is desistance by adulthood, very conservatively, 85% of the time, unless it is affirmed. That's why affirmation is not a good thing. Gender dysphoria carries with it the overwhelming probability of underlying mental health problems, adverse childhood experiences, autism spectrum disorder, and troubled family dynamics. Those are what really need to be dealt with. The probability of both desistance as well as the underlying problems are why watchful waiting has been the standard of care. Please understand, watchful waiting goes hand in hand with uh, intensive, in-depth uh, psychological investigation and support uh, for both the patient and the family because you're fairly sure to find issues in both. Know that there's strong international pushback happening in the scientific, judicial, and legislative realm, uh, rising against gender transition procedures in minors. Uh, know that transition affirmation is not proven safe nor effective long-term. It does not reduce suicides. And of course, it doesn't repair underlying mental health problems and trauma. <clears throat> and finally, there is always a more honest way to deal with gender confusion than the chemical sterilization and surgical mutilation of what are otherwise healthy young bodies. Um, sections I'm going to draw your attention to, but we just don't have time to do them right now. Faith is not the bad guy. I have a few little things there for you of interest. Stigma and minority stress do not explain for poor LGBT behavioral statistics. I have a lot of stuff there for you. Uh, it'll be of interest. Know that intimate partner violence is in fact a significant cause of LGBT suicide. Have some confirmation materials there. And starting here on page five, words matter. Just remember that language shapes thoughts, thoughts shape beliefs, and beliefs shape culture. So we can't comply with weaponized language that just forces us to surrender ground needlessly and paints us into a corner. 
We need to fight here for definition of words, I believe it was Galileo, who said before discussing anything, first define your frame of reference. So let's start with sex. Sex is objective, identifiable, immutable. It's determined at conception. It is not assigned at birth. And your sex is stamped on every nucleated cell you have in your body. Plus, it's highly consequential. Medically, uh, experimentationally, you can't ignore it. And even from uh, the U.S.'s National Institutes of Health, and I quote, sex is a biological classification encoded in our DNA. Males have XY chromosomes and females have XX chromosomes. And they go on to say here, every cell in your body has a sex. So in some quarters, that is known as hate speech, <laughs> but it's science. Uh, we see here uh, the DSM-5 on page 829 talks about sex as, quote, the biological indication of male and female understood in the context of reproductive capacity. Next point is that there are two sex cells, two gametes, sperm and ova. There is no third. It's biologically impossible to be born in the wrong body. And as psychiatry professor Stephen Levine says, biological sex cannot be changed. The very next thing we hear is, of course, well, what about intersex? Well, more professionally, we call those disorders of sex development. Those also are established at conception for the two one hundredths of one percent of people who have them. DSDs are definable medical problems. They're not identities. They're something someone has, but they're not who they are. And there's two main characteristics to DSDs. Uh, again, from the literature, point one, a diverse group of congenital conditions where the development of the reproductive system is different from what is usually expected. And point two, DSDs usually impair fertility. Now, biologic anomalies don't disprove uh, there being only two sexes, male and female, ordered for the purpose of reproduction. DSDs are not a third sex. Again, two sex cells, two gametes, sperm and egg, there is no third. And even the colloquialism intersex is intersex, not an extra sex. So the activists missed an opportunity there. Know that uh, disorder of sex development, intersex patients do not usually identify as, tri as transgender. Conversely, in those that are trans-identified, there's usually no inherent defect in sex organ development, function, or fertility, so they don't qualify as having a DSD. Basically, intersex and gender dysphoria are two very different things. Don't allow them to be wedged together for purposes of someone else's politics. Gender and its popular usage has become an engineered term. It leverages linguistics against biology. I'd have you think of it this way. Really, nouns have a gender. People have a sex. The first use of this idea of gender as something separate from sex was from uh, John Hopkins University psychologist John Money in 1955. He was the guy who put it in the peer review literature, referring to it as the identity of the intersexed self. But it was always ideology. It was never science. And he was unceremoniously kicked out of um, Johns Hopkins once it came to light what he was doing with his patients. Gender and his current usage is subjective. It's fluid and it's self-declare. So we're at a point where sex is biology, but gender has become ideology. The first problem this poses is if you're forbidden to define what a woman is, you can't protect her rights. And a lot of women's rights advocates are becoming aware of this problem. Gender identity now is a feeling, a self-perception, usually a tremendous stereotype. Now, the problem here is it's a mistake to stereotype people. There's a lot of ways to be a man, and you're still a man. There's a lot of ways to be a woman, and you're still a woman. I have a quote here for you uh, from theologian Christopher West, who actually points out, though, that if you're using any wor word that has the root gen on it, like, you know, generate, genesis, genetics, gender, genitals, it actually refers to reproductive capacity, the ability to give birth. So he says, contrary to widespread secular insistence, a person's gender is not a malleable social construct. Rather, a person's gender is determined by the kind of genitals he or she has. I'm going to move ahead here a little bit <clears throat> on what would be page seven. Gender dysphoria is a diagnosis. Think of it as a psychosocial neurodevelopmental issue, because that allows you to bring the, together the idea of the mental health problems, the adverse childhood events, ASD, and the family issues. It's great distress with the sex of a person's body. Um, transgenderism, though, is an overarching ideology. Ken Zucker of the University of Toronto, uh, he ran their gender clinic for a long time. I believe he's the guy who coined the phrase transgenderism. But even he says the term transgender identity is hardly an objective label 
for a child's gendered subjectivity. Gendered subjectivity, good way to remember this. So transgenderism and gender dysphoria are actually not necessarily the same thing. Moving ahead to page 10, I'm gonna take a little sip of water here, I'm getting all dried out. So the prevalent statistics again from the DSM-5, for natal males, maximally, the prevalence is 14 one thousandths of 1%. For natal females, maximally three one thousandths of a percent. But we have numerous surveys out of the United States uh, showing upwards of 2% of youth say, yeah, I, I may be trans. And in some school districts, we see it's supposedly 20%. So something changed, but it sure wasn't biology or genetics. Desistance is actually what's expected of gender dysphoria. That's the norm by adulthood unless it is affirmed. Again, conservatively, 85% of the time it desists by adulthood, unless it's affirmed. And I list for you several studies proving that point as well. Um, I think the seventh one here is actually a commentary paper by Ken Zucker uh, reaffirming the idea that desistance is the norm. Brain development in minors, this will be on page 11. Minors have developing but immature brains. Their minds change often. They are prone to risk-taking behavior. They're vulnerable to peer pressure, and they don't grasp long-term consequences. That's why we protect minors from so many things, and they need to be protected from this. Even the American Academy of the Pedi Pediatrics Health Daily Report, uh, April 2017, was talking about a University of Iowa study that claimed kids younger than 14 years of age could not reliably be trusted to cross a busy street. Now, this is the same group telling us, well, three-year-olds can tell us their gender, and it's nonsense. A three-year-old can't tell us their dinner or their bedtime. Uh, mental health issues, page 12. Remember, the overwhelming majority of the gender dysphoric have other mental health issues, neurodevelopmental problems, and by this we generally mean autism spectrum disorder, family issues very likely, along with those adverse childhood events. And now most are female, which is a, a 180 from how it was just a decade ago, decade and a half ago. A few studies here, 2015, out of Finland's Gender Identity Services, found 75% of the adolescents they saw were already undergoing psychiatric treatment for other reasons, and that 26% of them had autism spectrum disorder, 87% female. They also cautioned, and I quote, treatment guidelines need to consider gender dysphoria in minors in the context of severe psychopathology and developmental difficulties. 2014, four nation European study found almost 70% of people in general with gender dysphoria had, quote, a current and lifetime diagnosis other than the gender dysphoria that predated it. Out of the United States, 2018, the Becerra Kalki study, uh, also called the Kaiser Permanente study, uh, looking at electronic medical records of people in the Kaiser HMO in California and Georgia, 8.8 .8 million people there. They found high rates of psychiatric disorders and suicidal ideation before any gender non-congruence in the teens. And a list for you there, the stats, you'll see they're quite impressive. Out of Australia, 2021, a rare prospective study from a multidisciplinary pediatric gender service. Again, the slight majority of the patients were females there. High levels of distress, suicidal ideation, self-harm, suicide attempts, high rates of comorbid mental health disorders, anxiety and depression in more than half, behavioral disorders in a third, autism uh, disorder in 14%, and high rates of adverse childhood experiences, family conflict, parents with mental health issues, loss of important figures in their lives, and, and so forth. 2018, Dr. Lisa Littman, her groundbreaking survey of parents of rapid onset gender dysphoria youth, the parents reported 62.5% of those youth had a psychiatric disorder or neurodevelopmental disability before the onset of gender dysphoria. There, about 12% had ASD and about half had experienced uh, significant life traumas. Moving ahead here to page 14, the thing with a few points about the autism spectrum disorder and how overrepresented it is, uh, a quote for you here, a study that says the problem is not just uh, underlying uh, pre-existing conditions in some with gender dysphoria, but that autism spectrum disorder itself is associated with worse mental health. So you put those two together as particular trouble. I list for you a study out of Washington, D.C.'s National Children's Hospital 2023, where of the 68 gender care minors they had on record, almost half were autistic. 
we know that therapy helps. And by therapy, I have a paper here for you. It's a pilot study, 2022, a Dutch pilot study of gender dysphoric adolescents with ASD in which guided peer support group therapy was employed and found to be very helpful, separate and distinct from any attempt to transition these kids. So why autism spectrum? Autistic kids and people in general, and, and the whole spectrum, even down to Asperger's, uh, they, they're into concrete thinking. They have trouble with abstractions. So what happens to the kids is they get coached by the web or by friends. And of course, in ASD kids, they're less likely to have a lot of friends. So it tends to be the web. And they become convinced of something false. They decide, oh, now I know why I'm so different than all my friends. It's because I'm trans. Well, it's exactly the wrong answer. But once they've latched onto it, it's a problem. Also on page 15, personality disorders are common, especially narcissism. Uh, Ken Zucker, I list for you here a study where he looked, I should say a review article, where he looks at eight different studies, finds a rate of 20 to 60% prevalence of personality disorders in those with GD. If we're talking about adult males, autogynephilia looms large out of the literature. That's the propensity of certain males to be erotically aroused by the thought or image of themselves as women. So for some, cross-dressing is enough. For others, the cross hormones up the game, and for others, they can go the, the full way with surgery. Uh, the point about bullying, knowing this fact here is not going to make you popular. A large representative sample study out of Finland looking at 140,000 people, quote, we found that transgender identity was generally associated with perpetuating bullying and that the association was stronger than that of transgender identity and being bullied. So the Finns found that those with gender dysphoria are actually more likely to be the bullies than to be bullied. Uh, a study here out of Germany, uh, 2021, the title of it, not social transition status, but peer relations and family functioning predicts psychological functioning in a German clinical sample of children with gender dysphoria. Speaks for itself. Your relationships are actually more important than the transition process. Uh, and affirming parents actually do not improve the stats. Uh, we hear about the Olson study at 2016, the Durwood study at 2017, claiming that if you had very supportive parents, it helped a little bit with anxiety. Well, actually, it didn't. That was re the study uh, data was reevaluated by Shum and Crawford, and they actually find that when they crunch the numbers, uh, even in very supportive families, much higher rates of anxiety, poor self worth, somewhat worse depression. Um, skipping ahead here on page 17, rapid onset gender dysphoria. Uh, that is the sudden onset of dysphoria during or after puberty with no prior indication of it. Again, from Lisa Lippman's 2018 parental survey, they were able to discern certain hallmarks in these minors. One, they would have one or more friends that became gender dysphoric or trans identified. Uh, just having someone in your friend group that goes trans greatly increases the chance that other kids in the friend group will also. Uh, nextly, they found increased social media and web use before the declaration, worsening of the child's mental health as this process continued, worsening isolation from family and any non-trans identified friends, and then ultimately distrust of any information that came from non-trans affirming sources. Ken Zucker, uh, in a commentary in 2019, says, it is my view that this is a new clinical phenomenon, but he also notes they comprise the majority of his private practice adolescent patients. Uh, causes for suicidal behavior. Uh, this is an important section. I can't spend a lot of time on it, uh, but on page 18, there is no one cause, but mental health issues stand out. And here I'm referring to a 1994 publication from the U.S. Center for Disease Control on how to reduce uh, suicide contagion, copycat phenomenon, and they recommend against, quote, presenting simplistic representations of suicide. Suicide is never the result of a single factor or event, but rather results from a complex interaction of many factors and usually involves a history of psychosocial problems. So to reinforce that, um, and this is separate from that uh, publication, a study by Knock 2013 found 96% of US adolescents attempting suicide demonstrated at least one mental illness. Kavanaugh, 2003, 90% of adults and adolescents who completed suicide had unresolved mental health disorders. Kennebec, 2018, 
about 5% of all youth suicide can at least be partially attributable to media coverage. Uh, a review article in 2016 on the impact of social contagion on non-suicidal self-injury, they found, and I, I list more detail for you, very strong association with social contagion, both for NSSI as well as actual suicide attempts. Um, suicide and, excuse me, the social and peer contagion now of gender dysphoria uh, on page 19, again from Littman. She noted that with exposure and friendship groups, when you have a friend uh, in your group who comes out as trans, the average number of individuals who became trans identified was 3.5 per group. So 350% explosion in that. That's why you hear about things, for example, in the United States, where you'll have a, a high school cheerleader team where four of them say they're trans. Well, statistically, that's impossible unless you're allowing for social contagion. Lippmann also said, in other words, gender dysphoria may be used as a catch-all explanation for any distress an adolescent or young adult is feeling, whereas transition is promoted as a cure-all solution that, of course, it very much is not. And I have another study there for you on the, the idea of media effect and social contagion out of the UK and Australia. Uh, and both Finland and the uh, Cohere Finland's a division of their government, but both their statement and the French National Academy of Medicine's statement from last year both identify the idea of fads and social contagion and that parents and clinicians need to be on the lookout for it. Um, the idea of semantic contagion, I have that on page 20. That's simply the idea that when words or phrases that didn't exist before become common parlance, they also tend to become worldviews where people will reassess their own life experience through. So talk about transgender and transitioning and all that. Well, people start to misinterpret their life experiences through that. I have a section on the history of all this and how things came about for you, as well as where the finances came from. <clears throat> These are two very important sections. You're going to want to look those up. Ethical considerations. Well, consider the ethics of permanently medicalizing somebody for something that goes away 85% of the time that has other underlying contributors uh, and doing it based on a self-diagnosis, it sounds kind of unethical. The problem of diagnosis, uh, and I, I, I quote, forgive me here, I'm quoting the literature uh, where I, um, a bunch of endocrinologists and I uh, published this letter to the editor. <clears throat> there are no laboratory imaging or other objective tests to diagnose a true transgender child. And there's currently no way to predict who will desist and who will remain dysphoric. There's the problem of consent. We could do a whole article on this, but again, children have developing brains, their minds change often, they're prone to risk-taking behavior, vulnerable to peer pressure. They don't get long-term consequences. We protect them from things. We should be protecting them from this. A patient who undergoes gender transition is gonna be a patient for the rest of their lives. I have, ha have here uh, statements for you from the Swedish Pediatric Society, Swedish National Council of Medical Ethics, and even the UK's Bell versus Tavistock decision where they, uh, well, as was very well phrased by Bell versus Tavistock, there is no age appropriate way to explain to many of these children what losing their fertility or full sexual function may mean to them in later years. Uh, similar statement from Anthony Latham, uh, chair of the Scottish Council of Human Bioethics, and a recent article by Levine, Abrusesi, and Mason that explain it further. Now I'm at the major bullet point section, page 24. Uh, do not affirm prematurely. We find all kinds of things in the literature about this, just the opposite of what society is telling us. From the APA's Handbook on Sexuality and Psychology 2014, premature labeling of gender identity should be avoided. This approach runs the risk of neglecting individual problems the child might be experiencing. From the 2020 Nordic Journal of Psychiatry, and this is, I believe, coming from Professor Kaltiala out of Finland, an adolescent gender identity concerns must not become a reason for failure to address all of his or her other relevant problems in the usual way. And from Withers 2020, trans identification and its associated medical treatment can constitute an attempt to evade experiences of psychological distress. Know that uh, gender affirming uh, therapy guidelines derive from activist groups like WPATH, their standards of care, so-called, uh, very often look just like window dressing that's ultimately not followed, except the 2000, or the one that just came out, their SOC 8, where they remove all age restrictions. So now it's the Wild West out there. 2017, the Endocrine Society became the first actual medical organization to approve in, in limited cases transition for minors. 
but they state themselves that their medical evidence rating for puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones in selected minors is low, and that the support for adult genital surgery, very low. So this doesn't sound like evidence-based standards of care. And those same guidelines on page 38 and 95 say this, quote, the guidelines cannot guarantee any specific outcome, nor do they establish a standard of care. Well, we're told, well, this is the consensus. Well, consensus is not a substitute for truth. Groupthink and herd mentality, those are consensus items too. And sometimes consensus is a Castro consensus named after Fidel Castro. And that's the idea of a forced consensus, right? You'll believe this or else. Um, moving along here, skipping, skipping I'm on page 26. Um, skilled psychological investigation for underlying causes is supposed to be happening. That's supposed to be the standard of care. And yet it's shamed as being transphobic. Uh, there is strong international questioning of uh, transition procedures and minors going on now in the UK. I would refer you, and there, I have sections later on in this talk for you to go through where I list the comprehensive literature reviews, three coming out of the UK, two out of Finland, excuse me, two out of Sweden, one out of Finland, as well as one out of the state of Florida here contracted by Canadian University. Um, those are there, plus more details on what these nations have done. But just very briefly here, uh, for the UK, it's the National Institute of Healthcare Excellence, acronym NICE. Uh, their literature reviews on puberty blocking agents and cross-sex hormones, they are the best of their kind. The Bell versus Tavistock decision, uh, the 2022 CAS interim report, resulting in closure of the world's largest pediatric gender clinic, the UK's NHS GIDS Center. And now, uh, just recently, uh, there are new interim service specifications uh, that have come out for a whole new model of how to approach it. In Sweden, uh, just this year, 2023, a comprehensive literature review. Uh, the previous one out of 2019 was from the Swedish Agency for Health Technology Assessment and Assessment of Social Services, which resulted in the Karolinska Hospital, their major uh, research institute, and its component, Astrid Lindgren Children's Hospital, uh, doing a complete 180. So uh, the UK, Sweden, Finland, three countries that are turning from being you know, lead engines of gender transition procedures for minors to completely flipping that around, that the emphasis needs to be on mental health, at least until uh, the minor is an adult. Uh, Norway is reevaluating this. That was mistakenly reported a few months ago. So, oh, they've done the 182. They're actually looking at it. Uh, material coming out of Australia and Brazil, that's there for you too. As well as for the state of Florida, I've been contracted with the state of Florida helping them this process, but their Medicaid medical division uh, issued a rule last summer that they will no longer pay for gender transition procedures in minors or adults. Uh, we put together a generally accepted professional medical standards determination, the GAPAMS report that Florida requires, uh, 233 pages explaining you know, why it's that way, and there's a link there for you know that there's four levels of transition, social transition, and that anybody can do in a day. You change your name, you change your presentation, you know, voila. Puberty blockade, cross-sex hormones, really wrong sex hormones, and sex reassignment surgery, also known as gender affirming surgery, also known as gender confirming surgery, which shows you again how weaponized the language has become. Uh, but even social transition itself leads to more persistence. It reinforces the, the delusion. Uh, in the U.S., the FDA has not approved puberty blockers for this use, and yet there it is. I list for you out of the FDA website the warning they give when people use uh, medications that are not FDA approved for a certain indication. Know that the idea of puberty blockers as a pause button that buys time, that allows you to wait and see, that's a myth. Puberty blocking agents are gateway drugs that select persistence over natural desistance. It commits a child to cross-sex hormones. I list for you five studies showing the rate of persistence uh, of gender dysphoria and transidentification in those using puberty blockers is 96.5 to 100%. The risks of puberty blocking agents, not fully reversible. Long-term complications are possible even if they're stopped early. Infertility risk, because obviously they block the maturing of sperm and eggs. The genitalia are arrested in their underdeveloped childhood state so that even if someone decides to go on and get gender reassignment genital surgery, they can't do it because they've got too little tissue. Sexual dysfunction is caused in males, erectile dysfunction, uh, orgasmic dysfunction, ejaculatory impairment. In females, it induces a menopausal-like state. 
which is exactly what a girl in her teens and tweens does not need to be having. As for mental health, mood swings, depression, suicidal ideation, and even attempts are warned about on the package insert of Lupron, which is the main puberty blocking agent used in the US. It doesn't sound like something you'd want to give any kid who's got troubles. Bone mineral density is compromised by puberty blocking agents right at what should be its period of greatest growth in your life, hindering a brain development milestones that we don't know if you can get those back later on. And for sure, puberty blocking agents interrupt that time window that a young person has to develop brain, bone, psychology, and sex with their peers. Uh, they step out of that, it's lost forever. And also a new warning on the package insert about pseudotumor cerebri that can be caused by puberty blocking agents. And cross sex hormone use, if you follow puberty blocking agents with cross sex hormones, you've guaranteed sterility. The sperm and egg cannot develop. Risks of estrogen in biologic males, uh, cholesterol problems, blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes. And the risks of those are exponential, not just arithmetic. Um, Look at some of the studies I've listed there. You're, you're talking about, you know, four times the risk becomes 16 times the risk in, in very quick order. Increased chance of breast cancer, weight gain, insulin resistance, gallstones, and so forth. Testosterone use in biologic females, increased risk of heart attacks, strokes, breast and uterine cancer, diabetes, liver disease, hypertension, severe acne, and more. And know that in 2019, there was an international uh, panel of endocrinologists called together to look at what the literature showed about what is evidence-based about testosterone use in women. And they said the only evidence-based indication for testosterone therapy for women is the treatment of hypoactive sexual desire disorder. They also said there's insufficient data to support the use of testosterone for the treatment of any other symptom or clinical condition or disease prevention. And they finalized that the safety of long-term use of testosterone therapy in women has not been established. Sex reassignment surgery, uh, again, gender affirming surgery, uh, gender confirming surgery, showing you the weaponization of the language, it's cosmetic. And if we're talking about genital surgery, it only creates uh, poorly functional pseudogenitalia. Usually that person is giving up orgasms for life and not infrequently, they're giving them up before they've had one. They don't even know what they're losing. Sterility is guaranteed when you remove ovaries and testicles. There's more information there for you, especially on the subsection on this later in the paper. In 2023, a German study showed that those who underwent gender reassignment surgery achieved no improvement in loneliness or social isolation. 2011 study out of Sweden that you probably heard referred to before that looked at all SRS patients over 30 years. They found that if you follow them uh, 10 years out, not just the six months, one year, two years, that's so famous for these junk studies. But if you look 10 years out, they have 19 times the completed suicide rate of the general population, about three times the all-cause mortality, and about three times the rate of psychiatric hospitalization. 2019 study from Brandstrom and Pachankis, uh, claiming to be the first of its kind total population study of 9.7 million Swedes looking at records, ultimately showed that neither gender-affirming hormone treatment nor gender-affirming surgery uh, demonstrated any improvement in the mental health benchmarks they were looking at. A uh, 2016 study out of the Netherlands, again, showed that sex reassignment surgery is a coin toss, really not an agent of statistically significant net benefit. Uh, know that the suicide reduction claims of gender-affirming therapy are also a myth and they're used as emotional blackmail. We frequently hear parents tell us that they were told by the health professionals, the mental health professionals in their lives, look, do you want to be planning a transition or a funeral for your kid? Do you want a live son or a dead daughter? Well, gender transition procedures can't fulfill that promise. The rates of regret are said to be low, but the studies are consistently flawed, uh, ridiculously high definitions of regret, and very high rates of loss to follow up. Commonly, 20 to 60% drop out of the study. And also, these regret studies come out of the gender clinics. And one of the things the detransitioners tell us is, oh, we never go back to those. You know, I even list a study or a survey here for you of detransitioners that showed three quarters of them didn't even tell their existing doctor that they had detransitioned. Uh, I list for you common flaws. And these pro-gender affirming uh, treatment studies, you can do that at your own time. Know that the chemical sterilization and surgical mutilation of normal sex organs in children is not healthcare. 
Uh, and the very last section I have for you, don't really have time to go over it. I think I've already gone over my time. Um, sorry as I'm whipping through this so quickly here. Um, I, I call it guidance from the pros, um, advice from uh, different people in the field there for you. Um, I Right at the start of it, I say before we get to the pros, a few of my thoughts on this. Uh, a friend of mine in San Francisco has a two-part prayer he talks about. Uh, you can do this quietly and quickly. Number one, Lord, is this person teachable? Two, what would you have me say to them? Second point out of the gospel of John chapter five or six, the story of Jesus at the pool of Bethesda. And he asks the paralytic person there, uh, it says, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Well, we know as healthcare professionals, that's not rhetorical because a no answer is a stop sign. And there's some people who don't want to be well. Take, for example, helping people with addictions and alcoholism. You can't care about the problem more than they do and hope to get anywhere, right? Um, so one of the first things I wrote for the CMDA on this subject, and just quote from it here, you know, say you have a patient, be they open or be they hostile, and they're asking you about transitioning. Uh, there's six main points you can bring to them. One, desistance is the norm. Again, 80 to 95% of the time. There's underlying issues that need to be addressed first. They don't go away, and there can be a lot of them. Next, the short and long-term risks of gender-affirming therapy are serious, sobering. Next, the long-term benefits and safety of gender affirmation has not been proven. Regret is not rare, and a minor's brain isn't capable yet of that kind of adult decision-making. Last thing I have for you on the whole thing here um, is where to find different things. I've done my blogs for CMDA, a couple of podcasts I've done for them, a few documentaries I'm in, and legislative testimony from California, Ohio, European Parliament from last December, uh, and Kentucky, if you are so interested. Final, final points. Um, Mark Stein, he says, the future belongs to those who show up. We need to be showing up. A church mate of mine, Havila Cunnington, we succeed by outlasting the crowd. We may not look good, the last person standing wins. And lastly, from Pastor Ide Amuba, to stand is to win. So we need to show up, outlast the crowd, and simply stand. Thank you for letting me speak and to go over time a little bit. Uh, I think it's Q&A time. Andre, that's that's fantastic. It's been a pleasure listening to you. Thank you so much. And um, everyone who's been listening, you'll or if you've registered for the webinar, you'll get a copy of, of Andre's notes emailed to you. Uh, one of the questions was, there are some bits in the notes that have got lines through them, Andre. What's the significance oh, of those? Sorry. I, I, the, the copy you have won't have red letter and it won't have little lines. Those are notes to myself. Skip this so you can get it in in 37 minutes or whatever. Great. Okay, that's wonderful. So uh, moving on to some of the Q&As. Um, so the first question from John Brinkhoff is about desistance. We talked about social contagion in transitioning. Do we find now that there is a greater visibility of detransitioners that, that they are coming in clusters as well? Yeah, um, there's a read it um, sub website, you know, on, I, I actually have a link uh, for that to you at the end of the, the talk. Um, actually, it's in sorry, it's in the section on regret and detransition, um, and it has forty thousand members. I mean, that's how many people have you know regret and detransition that signed up just to that one website. So, as they are less under the thumb of the trans movement, you know, because they're shamed into being traitors if, if they say anything about regret. More and more people are coming forward. I'm very glad to tell you, uh, we have several lawsuits finally in the United States. The one I think will be our Bell versus Tavistock is Chloe Cole suing the Kaiser system. Two other people are joining in that. Um, our, our, our hope, our, our wish uh, is that as these lawsuits come up, that um, the social push will be the other way. Um, people who have been ruined by this going after the hospitals, the insurance companies, the pharmaceutical firms, the biotech firms uh, that made all this possible. So nobody wants to get sued, do they? And that, that really helps to focus the minds for the for big corporations and, and other people. And um, let's talk about autism a little bit. So you talked about some of the overlap there with autism. Does there seem to be any sort of common etiology going on there? Or does it seem to be just that these are people who don't fit in and then have um, you know uh, fixed ideas about what the solution might be? 
Yeah. Again, when I when I say well, what what I offered as my explanation there is actually my explanation, but um, I certainly know plenty of mental health people and pediatricians and so forth that agree. It's just um, you know, again, they're not really good with abstractions. They tend toward mm-hmm. concrete thinking, and the media and the education system and the entertainment industry, you know, all coming at them. Trans, trans, everything's trans, and so it's like, oh, okay, well, this this must be why I'm so different. It's because I'm trans. It's like, no, it's because you're neurodivergent. It's not doesn't have anything to do with trans, you know. But again, once that idea is locked onto and being reinforced, <clears throat> that is a group of people particularly prone to the misconception. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's another way that uh, autistic people are often being failed by society, isn't it? They're not given the right support and explanations for that. Yeah. Um, what would you advise us to do with those 15% or so of, of people who will persist in their gender dysphoria? I mean, would, you, would you ever support any degree of social, medical, surgical transition for the people who, who really do seem to have severe dysphoria that persist into adulthood? Yeah, again, we're we're talking about you know uh, maximally fifteen uh, percent of the people who will persist, uh, mm-hmm. and again, that's that's giving a lot of benefit to the doubt. It's usually nowhere near that high. Uh, my answer, and I, I just presented this to a, a state legislature in the United States. Uh, there is always a more honest answer to gender dysphoria than chemical sterilization and surgical mutilation. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I know. Uh, people who have, uh, well, uh, very prominent people, at least they were in the trans community, who uh, they've given, you know, they've stopped it, but they didn't detransition their bodies. Uh, it's like, well, you know, they've done so much to themselves and it's going to cost so much to go the other way. What are they going to do, you know? Um, so in their case, like everything else, you love people where you find them, you know, but again, uh, love has a corrective component. Otherwise it's just enablement and codependency. Um, again, this is, I think one of the benefits of the lawsuits is going to be forcing insurance companies to pay to correct in so far as is possible, what these people have done to their bodies, you know, as opposed to leaving them penniless, uh, and now, you know, feeling completely butchered and violated. Great, thank you. Now, many of the the people listening will uh, think this you know, this is amazing. These stats are incredible, and this clearly helps us to push back against the ideology. But when we're faced with a patient uh, who's in distress in our clinics, or perhaps the parents of a patient, um, clearly we need to be able to come at them with a different angle and really express that compassion and help them think it through. What kind of pointers would you give to a Christian clinician who's facing that and perhaps worried about? the risk of disciplinary action or that sort of thing? Well, the risk of disciplinary action is quite real. All you need is someone to complain. Mm-hmm. This is what I tell legislators too. That's why you have so few doctors testifying is the very real mm-hmm. risk of losing your jobs, your career, your personal safety, and per- potentially that of your family. But again, you know, you, what, what I advise doing <clears throat> is to say, look, my job as a physician or a mental health specialist is to give you the best evidence I can And I do understand that you have to be the one who makes the decisions. I don't make these for you. Mm -hmm. And the best information is, you know, again, the things we went through. Desistance is the norm, even some desistance in adulthood, too. There's virtually always underlying mental health problems, adverse childhood events, you know, et cetera, bad family dynamics. Those don't go away. They need to be dealt with no matter what decision you make. Uh, Nextly, understand that transition is not proven safe, is not proven effective. It may not do what you think it's going to do for you. And it's full of risks, you know, boom, 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 boom. Again, a a sobering talk about the risks and the fact that you have other choices out there, you know, mental health uh, input is at least as effective as any kind of gender transition procedure. Plus it leaves you intact and fertile and able to have orgasms. You know, just based on that, it's superior because the risk profile is far, far lower. Um, but you know, ultimately, I mean, I have some patients in my office, they stay the trans way, you know, um, and I can't force a decision on somebody, but you do show them excellence and compassion. And you know, they, they know where you stand. So when them seeing you as an excellent, you know, professional, uh, that's gonna weigh on their decisions too. And then tincture of time, tends to achieve some things as well. 
Great. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of pronouns, now this is obviously a really tricky uh, situation, is that, and you know, with children particularly, and, and also with adults. Uh, what sort of pointers have you found for how to handle the pronouns question? Um, I, I go two different ways on this. I hope this doesn't sound too contradictory. But in my lecture on rights of conscience, you know, I, I provide people the high court and Supreme Court decisions in the United States that support the idea that nobody can dictate your speech. You know, freedom of speech is a big thing uh, in the United States. And we have actual court rulings that say, you know, you can't make someone comply with pronouns for one. The pronouns can change on a weekly basis. What are you going to do? Enforce that with the weight of law? Um, so there's the freedom of speech issue, and that I, I you know, I would choose to stand strong on. Um, there's avoidance. Keep referring to the person by their name, and you never have to use a pronoun. Now, if someone's coming after you and trying to force you into something, well, that's on them. You know, uh, again, just don't use them. However, people in ministry. In specific, you know, Christian ministry to sexual minorities and the trans and all that, they they tell me different. They say, look, ministry is messy. You know, it's a lot like surgery and the emergency room work. And actually in a relationship with a person where they understand where you're coming from, we do at first use their preferred pronouns, you know, as they're going along the growth process. Now, someone can counter that by saying, well, you know, reinforcing a delusion is hardly helping someone grow. Uh, but but there it is. That's that's both sides of the story for you. Yeah, it's a very tricky situation, isn't it? And I guess we will, some of us will come to different views on that. Um, what someone's put in the Q&A there about a, a UK doctor called David McCarath or McCarath, who's recently in a lot of trouble for that. And uh, I mean, I've, I know David and I've spoken with him. I think it's fair to say he takes a very black and white view of yeah. the world and how you should respond to it so i think that explains something of where he's gone and how he's got to it so we don't have to take yeah. that view but there'll always be that right. challenge of what are we expressing and how right. are we are we helping or hindering them yeah i had a good but long talk with david in hungary it was a lot of fun <laughs> yeah yeah me me also um tell us about uh, dr zucker because you've mentioned him and i know he's one of those people who's been gone after by activists is he still right. practicing uh, what sort of damage has um, there been to his career through he, this? He's like way into retirement from the academic point of view. Having said that, um, the, the thing with Zucker, you know, he for decades ran, uh, you know, one of the preeminent uh, gender clinics, you know, in the world out of Toronto. But they were famous even there. And mind you, you know, most of the big faculty that you, you quote from there are gay identified people. Um, and they strongly went after the psychological underpinnings of gender dysphoria. Um, one of them, I, I believe, um, Ray Blanchard uh, said, look, we're not saying there's such thing as a transgender person. We're saying that gender dysphoria in certain highly selected individuals can reasonably tre be treated with some degree of gender transition. But since they primarily went after the underlying problems, knowing that's where their money was, so to speak, uh, the activists went after them and, and got Ken Zucker canned. He countersued um, and ended up winning like 700,000, you know, which for the United States, that's chicken feed. <laughs> but in Canada, that's a, a really big decision. Um, mm -hmm. And Ken continues to publish. Uh, he's, you know, got his downsides and stuff, but a very interesting figure. He's also uh, the founder and um, was until recently the main editor of Archives of Sexual Behavior which interesting publication because sometimes some of my colleagues have gotten um, really uh, challenging studies you know i mean that really challenge the norm of the narrative out there published in asb it takes about a year to do it um but they did it you know so they can they can be courageous there great thank you um stepping back a little bit and looking at the direction of travel in in different countries you've obviously referenced the pending closure of the Tavistock Clinic in the UK. I didn't realize that it was the world's largest pediatric gender clinic. And clearly we were very heartened by the direction of some of the progress in the UK. It does feel like the pendulum is swinging back towards sanity in some areas. What sort of feelings do you have in, in the US in other countries about the, the directions? What sort of areas for hope and optimism are there? And what particular areas of concern where we really need to look out for uh, trends at the moment can you think of yeah uh, good things happening in italy good stuff coming out of belgium 
you know, a lot of other places where this is being reevaluated. Uh, maybe not on the part of the activists, uh, but but in terms of the medical science community and so forth. Uh, one thing out of the CAS uh, review interim report, the introduction of the glossary section, I forgot if that's page 78 or somewhere in the 70s. First thing they say is, you know, gender affirming care, an American model of care. And that's what it's become. People act like it comes out of the Netherlands and the Dutch protocol and all that, which by the way, uh, two different studies, one by Oxford's uh, Michael Biggs and another uh, Abruzzese, uh, Levine and Mason, which I have in the notes there for you. Uh, that, that's the end of the, the Dutch protocol. They, they tear it apart. The second paper is actually referred to as the eulogy of the Dutch protocol. It's WPATH, which is an American activist group, not a scientific group, not a medical group, but they act like they're one. And it's their so-called standards of care that's promulgated everywhere. You know, the hospitals and the clinics that do this in the United States all talk about, oh, we, we follow the WPATH standards of care. Well, it's not, you know, and we're challenging these things in court. Um, but I, I am sad to say, you know, the U.S. is the lead dog in pushing this stuff. I mean, Canada's way over the edge and, you know, Australia too. Um, but, you know, it's over here, we stand guilty. Um, so we have states like Florida uh, setting the legislative example. And the whole time we were working on that project with them, we were told, you know, we want to do this so that other states and other countries can use what we've done and that it will hold up in court all the way to the Supreme Court. And it just finished its second court challenge and now we'll likely be going to the 11th circuit where we think we'll have a very favorable bench uh, to be presenting things to. Um, and the main malpractice case is the uh, Chloe Cole uh, versus uh, Kaiser. Uh, again, for other people in that, there's a similar case out of Oregon, one out of North Carolina and one out of Texas. And uh, the attorneys for a couple of those groups have contacted me for information. So with the right malpractice case and the, the right legislative push, things start to fall. If the United States were to get a Republican president next, I think we can make short work of this. But it is all going to come down uh, it, it just under the weight of science alone. But we don't want to wait, you know, the 15 years for that to happen because uh, too many kids are going to be they're being injured every day. Uh, the sooner we, we bring this down, the more lives are going to be protected. Yeah, and I think that quote you made, you gave earlier about being the last person standing, you know, just sticking around, you know, things will come, won't they? The, the, the truth will out before too long. We've got to stick around and be faithful in that time. So we're coming into land now, a couple of last questions. Uh, any thoughts on the, the intersex question? I know that you said that that is different to transgender, but obviously we've got people there with genuine medical issues and, and really? often psychological issues as well. Is there any sort of hormone therapy for them or what kind? Is there any application or overlap with the things you've said about into yeah. the intersex questions? Uh, treating disorders of sex development is a highly specialized uh, field of medicine. Again, it's a specific uh, diagnostic set of entities, very small part of the population. Again, the activists try to make it sound like it's more than it is by including things that actually are not DSDs in the total. Um, but within that small number, there's all kinds of different ones. So, you know, you need the pediatric endocrinologist, the, the geneticists, the plastic surgeons, but potentially, but in some of them, the best thing to do is absolutely nothing till the kids are old enough to make their own decisions, you know, in terms of what's going to be done to their body. There's a few of them. You do need to act very quickly in order to preserve uh, any hope of fertility. But again, mm -hmm. that's what a responsible team approach is going to do. Uh, nothing should be in a rush. And it's it's individual. You're talking about a medical issue there, as opposed to gender dysphoria, where the problem's here, and it's chemical sterilization and surgical butchery that's being recommended that can't hope to affect what's here. Yeah, thank you very much. And that just leads us nicely onto the last question I was going to ask, which is that, could you explain why you said that those with gender transition become patients for life? I think that's yeah. To what so you're once you're on saying, wrong sex hormones, you never quit needing those wrong sex hormones. You know, the day you stop, you know, your your biology takes over, um, and there's complications as we've listed that can come with those, and so you have to be on the lookout for that as well. Um, for uh, you know, gender affirming surgeries, you know, again, many choose not to have them. Particularly, the genital surgeries aren't that popular because the word's out that they're not that good, 
and there's a lot of problems with it. But if you have them, there's daily maintenance you need to do, still going to have potential complications, the need for further surgery. So this is a money train for pharmaceutical firms, for the medical industry, for any biotech company that can come up with some widget uh, that fits the bill. Uh, people are profiteering. It's the worst possible face of capitalism. Uh, and of course, you know, with in, increasing the market share, going from you know thousands of a percent of people that identified as you know gender dysphoric transgender, to if it really is up to two percent claiming it now, that's a one thousand fold increase in market share. Someone's profiteering, and they need to pay for it. Yeah, yeah, and I guess if if it does turn out that the gender incongruent teenager is simply a same-sex attracted teenager well you don't have to do any surgery or treatment and you know that doesn't make them a patient does it they're, and, they're and this is why this is such person. a yeah this is such a hands across the aisle uh mm -hmm. protest movement i mean it's people of all political you know uh, uh, uh um convictions working together the religious the non-religious uh we we have groups uh, radical feminists that are helping us. There's even an adult trans identified group that helps us as, as well as gay identified groups, all of whom agree, um, or at least those who do agree are the ones working with us that no, we protect minors from this. These are decisions you can't even approach unless you're an adult. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, then when people come up with uh, the, the classic, oh, you know, uh, this is conversion therapy against trans kids. My answer to that, um, which I first uh, put to the streets in the UK there a year and a half ago, is I don't know of anything more conversionary than the chemical mm -hmm. sterilization and surgical mutilation of healthy bodied young people uh, for a mental health problem that usually goes away by adulthood. That's conversion. I think that's a great place to, to draw things to a close, Andre. Thank you so much um, for you. all that you've presented. We've had a, a fascinating and a packed hour together. So thank you all very much for joining us. And thank you particularly to Andre. You've summarized a, a vast and a complex and a fast moving uh, subject area brilliantly. So let me remind you that we'll be writing to all of those who registered for the webinar within the next 24 hours. We'll give you a link to the webinar video. We'll give you Andre's notes without the cross through lines and the red bits in them. So it'd be really uh, great to go over uh, and look in there. As you'll have seen, though, there's so much more to digest there. May the Lord give you wisdom and courage to serve him in whatever situation you find yourself before we see you again. And please let your colleagues know about ICMDA webinars. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>